Welcome to the Bolingbroke Church. We are just about to get started in a few minutes, but before we do, we want to know where you're worshiping with us from. So in the comment section, go ahead and let us know where you're from. In the next couple of minutes, you're going to see a couple of announcements, and that's because we want you to stay in the know about what God is doing through the Bolingbroke Church. Thanks for joining us. Help me trust you to provide Your book of living water And your ravens of daily bread You're the God of Elijah Jehovah Jireh My provider The meter of needs So give me the patience To wait on the rain just in who calls me to be. Who is he? The champion? The champion of Israel. You're the guy of victory. Yet in the struggle. Yet in the struggle. You're the one who comforts me. Stand within your way Why? Cause you're God upon the mountain And you're God in the valley Say you're the God of Elijah Jehovah Jireh My provider The meter of needs Give me the patience To wait on the ravens And trust What's going on everybody? Welcome to Bolingbroke Church Online. We are so happy that you got to join us today for worship. Now, wherever you are, if you are in the Bolingbroke area in Illinois, if you're in Chicagoland area, or anywhere around the U.S. or around the world, we're so happy that you're here. Go ahead and put your name and where you're worshiping from in the chat right now so we can get to know you a little better. Now, after the service, go ahead and visit our website, bolingbroke.church, and go to the connection tab. There you'll find our connection page where we can get connected with you and get to know who you are and how we can help you on your walk with Christ. Now, you can also find that same link in the links in the description below. If you have children ages 0 to 4, we have classes just for them online. Visit Disciple Town Kids on YouTube or Disciple Town Kids on Facebook and you will be connected to our discipling for all ages 0 to 11. Now, we have brand new videos every single week just for them so you can help them disciple at home. Now, wherever you are and how, whatever your week looked like this week, we want to let you know that this is a place where you could rest, where you could sit and you could take in the Word, but also spend time with God. This is a special day that we call the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a day that instituted in the Bible that has showed us all throughout it that it is a day that God has ordained, that God has created just for us to experience an intentional time with Him. So wherever you are, we invite you to sit in the presence of God that loves you, that cherishes you, that has called you to this moment right now. Welcome to worship and welcome to Bolingbrook Church. The way that as Christians we fight through challenging times is with thankfulness, is with prayer, and it definitely with praise. So join us as we do those things here. Here we go. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. So I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting 
vagabond And just when And just when I ran out of road I met a man I didn't know And he told me in the wind, like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my, so, so long to my old friends. Burning and bitterness, just keep it moving. You ain't welcome here. From now till I walk, from now till I walk, streets of gold, I'll sing Says, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. You say, get up, get up, get up, yeah, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up all, all my free people. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Come on now, get up, oh, get up the grave of sadness and depression today. Get up, get up, get up, don't stay there. Get up out of that grave.
is how I fight my bets. This 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 is how I fight my bets. Oh, with thankfulness. This is how I fight my bets. With thankfulness. This is how I fight my bets. Standing on those promises. It may look like, see, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. See, to others, see, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded. Oh, when the enemy surrounds me like a flood, even in that time, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. This is how I find my this is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. Come on, Christian. This is how I find my battles. Oh, you better keep fighting. This is how I fight my best. Don't give up. This is how I fight my best. And don't give in. This is how I fight my best. This is how I fight my best. See, it may look like, it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Oh, you guys better testify here. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like where you It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Standing, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of Christ by
This is how I find my best. Last time, sing. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus shout Jesus from the mountains I'll shout Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and where you are. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus
your family today. Cry Jesus. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a Hi everyone, I am glad that you are here worshiping with us today. It's always good when we can sing together, pray together, and delve into God's Word together. Today's a special Sabbath because on the second Saturday of every month here at the Bolingbrook Church, it's what we call our Connection Sabbath. So if you're in the Chicagoland area, I want to invite you today at 12.30 p.m. We're gathering at Living Water Community Church. Our, all the information is on our Facebook, our Instagram, and in the comment section below. We want you to be a part of it because today we are doing communion. And if you've never experienced communion at the Bolingbroke Church, I promise you that it'll be like something you've probably never experienced before. And we hope that the Spirit uses it in a powerful way to bring you closer to Jesus. So that's today at 12.30 p.m. I hope to see you there. But as we get ready to jump into the Word, I want to invite you, wherever you are, let's pause and let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that that there is this time in the week, this space in the week where we can pause and silence all those things that are pulling us away from this moment. God, we ask now that as we read the words that have been true for thousands of years, that they would be new to us today. Open our eyes, open our hearts, and let us receive this word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So over the last five weeks, we have been in our series, The Last Words. We've literally been looking at the words of Jesus as he hangs on the cross. And the reason that we're doing this is because we believe that the words that Jesus speaks at his dying breathe life into us as we live. If Jesus went to such great efforts to get these words out, then for us, we want to take them seriously. We want to value them and treasure them. I mean, everything that Jesus says is valuable and good. But the words that he says on the cross, literally breaths before he dies, now those words are priceless. They're invaluable. And we believe that those words actually can speak life into our lives today. And so today we are on week six. Over the last several weeks, we have heard Pastor Dave Kilatan really break down the word. And I got to tell you that it has been a blessing for me to be able to sit in the church and be able to hear really powerful sermons. And it has been wonderful for my soul. It has been filling for my heart. And I hope that it has been the same for you. And if it's been the same for you in the comment section below, just go ahead and say praise God or amen or thanks, uh, Pastor DQ, whatever it is that comes to you. But we're continuing this series and we're making our way toward the final words of Jesus. Next Saturday is our Easter weekend experience, two services, 10.30 a.m., 12.30. And we're looking toward the final words of Jesus. But just before he says those last words, we're going to be looking at other words that Jesus says today that in many ways is going to connect all seven of his last seven statements. So I want to invite you, if you have your Bible, we're going to jump right into Luke chapter 23, and I'm going to start reading in verse 44. And here's what the Bible tells us. Now it was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all who knew him 
including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. I want to focus for just a moment in verse 46, where it tells us that Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, 2022, when we look back on this 2,000 years later, we look at these words of Jesus and we hear Jesus say, Father, I commit myself into your spirit. And to be honest, that's what we expect Jesus to say. Like Jesus being the Son of God has shown us what it's like to enter into God's presence on the daily basis, having a life of prayer, understanding scripture, memorizing scripture, going to the synagogue, having a small group. We have seen Jesus. Show us what it's like to live a dedicated Christian life. So when he gets to the cross and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, we think to ourselves, well, Jesus, that's what you're supposed to say. Jesus, that's what you've been saying for the last three and a half years of your ministry. And so we've come to expect these words from Jesus, and and we pray these words sometimes, except that as I was reading over this passage over the last really two weeks, there's something that jumped out at me. There was a a revelation that God gave to me as I was reading through the scriptures that in all the years that I've preached this message, I never saw. I mean, how many times has that happened to us? There's something right in front of us, right in front of our noses, the ketchup in the refrigerator door, right? For some reason, we can never see it. And so as I was reading this passage, there was just something that jumped out at me so strongly that I had never seen. And I realized that in the moment that I read what I'm about to share with you, it was what I needed in that specific moment in my week. So Jesus says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I surrender. I give all to you. Listen, I am trusting you. But what we forget is that within those same three hours where the, where the Bible tells us that darkness filled all of the earth, that in those three hours, Jesus, just before he commits himself to the Father, he had said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, we, we see this words of Jesus and we say, I want to commit my life to Jesus too. But what we forget and what makes this statement so much more powerful than we could ever imagine is that just before Jesus had committed himself and trusted himself to the Lord, what, to God, what we find is that Jesus had also said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus and his humanity felt separation between himself and the Father, the the one that Jesus, and if you go back back and read the Gospel of John, time after time, Jesus says, I and the Father am one. I have come from the Father. The Father has sent me. I speak only what the Father tells me to say. Jesus has this undeniable, eternal connection with God the Father because Jesus was God as well. And yet on the cross, we see that there was this distance that Jesus felt alone and forsaken, that, that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was asking God if there's any other way. And I've come to realize that perhaps the reason Jesus was asking God if there was any other way, if there was a better way to do this, an easier, less painful way, it's not because Jesus was afraid of suffering physical death. But I think that perhaps Jesus didn't want to feel that separation that he was going to feel from the Father. And it wasn't that God left him. God doesn't forsake him. You see, that's what sin does in our lives. When we sin, it's it's that we separate ourselves from God. God is gracious. God is merciful and he is loving. God is is quick to forgive. God is quick to pursue. God is quick to be there when we open ourselves up to him. But when we sin, it's as though we are saying, God, I know you have blessing for me. God, I know you have a plan for me. God, I know that there is a path that you desire for me to walk down. But when we sin, we say, God, I know that. But maybe God's timing is taking longer than we want. So sometimes what sin is, is us trying to get God's blessing in a way other than the way God wants to give it to us. Sin literally means missing the mark. There is a way that God has designed your life. 
There is a way that God has designed purpose and intention in your life. But whenever we try to seek that and fulfill that, anywhere outside of God's plan, we're missing the mark. You know, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 59 that our iniquities have made separation between you and God. It is our sins. It is us always trying to get our own way that creates a distance between God and us. And it's not that God is standing up there in heaven looking down on us and he has this, uh, this um, the word just escapes me, clipboard <laughs> with a sheet of paper, or I guess in 2022 it would be a PDF on an iPad or something. And God's not just standing in heaven and he has a checklist of all the sins that are possible to do in a day. And he's not just watching you and checking off all the sins you're doing. I'll be honest, sometimes we have that vision and that view of God that God is ready to smite us, that God is ready to punish us at every moment that we commit a sin. And it's this Old Testament understanding of Scripture where we look back on the Old Testament and we see all the times that God uh, talks about disciplining us and God's wrath coming upon the earth. We look at the story of Noah and the flood and we say, see, God is ready to punish because there is so much sin in the world. And for many of us, There are moments in our lives that we have this Old Testament view of God and we think that every time something bad happens in our life that God is actually punishing us. The reality is is that for the Old Testament, that's how they understood God because that was the depth that they could understand God. But that's why God sends Jesus. God sends Jesus, which is like God in human flesh. The the word that we use is incarnation. (laughs) to be incarnate, like right, like carne, meat, right? To be in the flesh. In Jesus, God becomes human. To correct our understanding, to show us what it truly means that God is love. Jesus says, I don't come into the world to judge or to condemn. Jesus says, I have come to the world to save. I've come to the world to lay down my life. For that purpose, I was sent. Jesus comes to show us the clearest picture of God's love for us. God is a loving God who's not just waiting for you to mess up. God doesn't have a list of all the sins in your life and he's just waiting for you to mess up so that he can check off that box that you messed up today and so today you're losing your salvation, but... Tomorrow, if you're better, then you will be saved again. That's not what God is doing. That may be how we have distorted the image of God, but that's not what God is doing. God was always sending Jesus into this earth to show you and to show me what it looks like to live truly alive, what it looks like that God loves us so much that he would even die for us. How many times have we told someone we love, I would die for you. I would take a bullet for you. I would do anything for you. We say that as humans, God actually delivers on that. God lays down his life in the person of Jesus. So when Jesus is up on that cross and he says, my father, why have you forsaken me? It's It's not that God had pulled away from him. It's that because Jesus was absorbing in some cosmic way the sins of the world, past, present, and future, that in that he felt the separation of God from him because sin separates us. Sin leads us into the darkness. Sin causes shame and guilt on our lives where we go and try to hide in the shadows and the darkness of our lives so no one will see. And Jesus absorbs all of that. Romans chapter 8 verse 39 says that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There is no sin that you can do that will separate you from the love of God. God's not going to turn his back on you. We may turn our back on God, but God will not because there is nothing you can do that can separate you from the love of God. There is no sin too dark 
There is no failure too final. There is no mistake that can ever separate you from the love of God. We may feel that separation, but church, hear me. It's not God who's leaving you alone. It's not God that's forsaking you. Sometimes in this world, we do have to suffer the natural consequences of the decisions that we make, and that's just a normal part of life, but it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. Jesus hangs on that cross, and He still has the strength and the will and the desire and the love to utter these seven last statements so that in 2022, we would be having this conversation about what it means that Jesus loves you so immensely, so powerfully, He would lay His life down for you. That He would take the separation that He felt from the Father, He would take that as a love token for you. Jesus loved us so much that He would suffer the darkest death, alone and feeling forsaken. But we missed the mark. And Jesus absorbs that for us. So when Jesus says the words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, Jesus was feeling that separation. Jesus was feeling alone and abandoned and forsaken. Jesus was feeling like all of this was now on his shoulders. He felt that separation. He couldn't see God. He felt all alone. All he sees is darkness. And even in the moment of his greatest aloneness, Jesus still says, Father, I commit myself into your hands. Jesus may not have been able to sense the presence of God. Jesus may have felt like he was all alone. He couldn't see what was going to happen tomorrow. Jesus knew that the prophecy would be that even though he lays his life down, that it would be taken back up, that God would bring him back to life as the victorious and triumphant Christ. But in that moment when Jesus hangs on the cross, there is darkness, the whole world becomes dark. In that moment where maybe he couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, Jesus still commits his entire existence into the hands of God. Even though he felt forsaken, even though he felt alone, even though he felt that deep chasm that sin does that separates us from our Heavenly Father, even though Jesus feels all that, he still commits his life to God. I mean, that's faith. What Jesus knew about prophecy, what Jesus knew about Scripture, what Jesus knew about the Father's plan, Jesus still had to die And I don't know about you, but in this earth, when we die, I haven't seen any resurrections. I've been in hospitals where people die day in and day out, and there have been no resurrections. I have wanted, I have wished that there was a way that there would be resurrections, but there are no resurrections in this earth. And Jesus understood that, but Jesus chose to trust that God's word was true. Even when Jesus couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, he chose to put his trust in the words of God that said, though you may die, you will come to life in three days. That on the third day, you would find resurrection. So Jesus was willing to entrust, to commit his entire life, even though he may not have been able to see how God was truly going to work this out. Now, please hear me. I am not being heretical. I, I have the whole scriptures. I, know, I already knew the end before I read this part of the story. We already see Jesus as the resurrected one. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. We know that. But as a human, Jesus still goes through this darkness. And what's so powerful is that though Jesus maybe couldn't see everything, he chose to trust what God had said. So here's a question that I have for you. What would it look like for you? What would it look like for your faith 
If even in those moments when you your back is against the wall, where you don't know how things can ever work out better, maybe you've been trying to pay off that debt. Maybe you're trying to find a new place to live in, but because this market is so insanely crazy, you feel like you're never going to find a place. Maybe your marriage is at the end of its life. Maybe you've gone through that divorce. Maybe you're looking for that job. Maybe you need that raise. I don't know what it is. But for many of us, there are things in our lives that we see the circumstances and we think, this is impossible. All we see is darkness. We are blind to the possibilities. What would your life look like if in those moments, like Jesus, you were able to commit your entire life to God and say, God, I don't, I don't know how you're going to fix this. I don't know that I even have the resources to come up with to be able to help you fix this. So instead of me trying to do it, God, I'm just going to commit it into your hands. I'm going to commit myself, my husband, my wife, my children, my job, my church, my neighbors, my family. I'm going to commit everything into your hands, God. What would your life look like? How would your life change if you truly committed yourself to Jesus? And I'll be honest, um, I like to believe that I have committed my whole life to Jesus. I've given my life to serve God in a local church. I feel like I'm committing my life to Jesus. And what I find, and especially over the last several days, there, it has been a whirlwind of busyness in my life. It's as though there is a jar of water and there's mud in there and you keep shaking it up and the water is murky. Now, everything is going well in my life, so I just have to give that disclaimer. But it's been one of those weeks where like, I've been waiting for things to settle so I can take a deep breath. <laughs> and, and when that happens in my life, I am what you call a classic overfunctioner. So if things need to be done, I go into hyperdrive and I'll wake up early. I'll go to bed a little bit late. I, I need my seven hours of sleep, but I will go to bed late. I will work hard. I will double book meetings. I will do all sorts of things to try to make everything work, make everything right. And I will do it for as long as I can. That's what I do. And then last night I was looking over this message. I was trying to make some notes and, and God says to me, have you committed everything into my hands? Like, are you really just entrusting me with everything, David? And in that moment I realized, no. Because what I was doing is that I was trying to do everything I could. I was trying to fix everything. I was trying to meet every goal, every deadline. I was trying to do all of this on my own. And I realized I haven't been committing this to the Lord and not in some bad way. I'm still doing my daily devotionals. I'm still praying throughout the day, but I wasn't releasing the outcome to God. So I think that we still have to work hard and be faithful and be obedient and do what God is calling us to do. But God is asking us, God is asking me to be faithful to the process and then entrust the outcome to God. And I wasn't entrusting the outcomes on things in my life to God. So Jesus' words on the cross are like a bullhorn in my head this week saying, all you have to do is commit all this into the hands of God. And it's not like God is asking me to do this for the first time. I can look back over the 40 years of my life and I can, put, I can point back to just like a week and a half ago, impossible things that God has done for me. And God says, how many more times do I have to show you that I am infinitely more powerful than you on your best day after drinking three energy drinks just to get everything done? Like Red Bull may give you wings, but God is saying, you don't need those wings. If you entrust everything into my hands, I will help you to accomplish what you need. But God is just saying, do you trust me with the outcome? Jesus Though he was going through the darkness of his life, 
Those three hours, the Bible writers say that the sun stopped shining, that darkness came over the earth, which is the biblical way and God way of saying that darkness was thick. And Jesus, feeling that separation, he couldn't see forward, and he chose still to entrust his entire existence, his future, his destiny, his purpose, everything Jesus had done for the last 33 and a half years of his life, he entrusted that to God. He entrusted the outcome to him. And what we find is that on the third day, Jesus was resurrected. The tomb was empty. Jesus is alive. If God can raise someone from the dead who has been dead three days, God can surely do impossible for you in your life. But you got to commit your entire self to God. Commit your mind, your body, your soul, your family, your children. Commit everything to God. You know, it's interesting that Here in in that last passage from Luke chapter 23, um, verse 49, we kind of just read past it, but I'm going to read it here again. It says, after Jesus had died, the centurion saw that he was actually the son of God. He came to believe, but look at what verse 49 says. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Like, one of those women was his mom. One of the women that was watching was Jesus' mom. Now think about this for a second. How many times when Jesus was born and she was holding Jesus, I wonder how many times Mary would commit Jesus to the Heavenly Father. How many times Mary must have prayed over Jesus as she swaddled him, as she rocked him back and forth to go to sleep, and maybe he had one of those bad days. How many times did she pray over her son who would be the son of God, God in the flesh? How many times did Mary pray over Jesus as a child and a baby? She was preparing him for this moment. That the prayers that she perhaps prayed for him at his birth were the prayers that were still on his lips at his death. Father, I commit myself to you. You know, every morning my daughter Everly, she wakes up, she waits for me to come into the room. We have a little monitor so I know when she wakes up. And she waits for me to come and pick her up and hold her. We walk back to my office. I I close all the blinds because, you know, it's dark in the room when she wakes up. And so I close all the blinds. I turn the lights off to transition her eyes. (laughs) I hold her in my office chair and I just kind of rock back and forth. And she just sits there. And I sing to her the songs that I sang to her the very first day that I held her in that hospital. And so for three years, almost every single day, I will sing the same three songs. And then just the other day, she started singing one of those songs back to me. And I thought in that moment, I thought about Mary and I thought about Jesus and I thought about how she played such a pivotal role in the man that Jesus would become. And how all the prayers that she prayed over him prepared him for the cross. And so I pray over my daughter and I commit her to the Lord every single day. And if I could do that, knowing that my daughter is just my daughter, how much more would Mary have done that knowing that Jesus was the Son of God? The prayer on Jesus' lip as he hung on the cross are not a prayer only for our death, but they are words of hope for you in your living. What would it look like for you to commit your entire self to God? Commit every level, every area, every bucket of your life, just simply commit it all to God. Work hard, keep doing all that you're doing, keep being obedient, but entrust the outcome to a God who has infinitely more resources than we do. 
That's my prayer for you today. If you find yourself in a moment where there is darkness all around you and you can't see that light at the end of the tunnel, and maybe you've been praying the same prayer day in and day out and you don't know. There is uncertainty in front of you. There are changes, there is transitions. There are people coming in and people coming out of your life. Perhaps you're dealing with some kind of financial struggle. Maybe you're dealing with a relational aspect of your marriage, of your relationship, and you don't know how it's gonna get better. Maybe that relationship has ended and you're just trying to move on. You're just trying to do your very best to heal. In that moment, can you entrust all of yourself, commit every part of you into the hands of the God who says, look, I know what it's like to go through darkness. I know what it's like to feel alone. I know what it's like to feel like you have to shoulder all of this by yourself. I know what it's like to feel pain and suffering. I know what it's like because I've gone through it. And I can promise you that if you trust the outcome to your heavenly father, it may not be easy. It will probably be painful at times. It may not even be the way you want it to be resolved. But if you commit all of this to God, God will be faithful to deliver you. What would your life look like if you could commit every part of your life to Jesus? For Jesus to whisper those words at the end of his life, perhaps maybe the very words that give you renewed life today. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, you are a God who has literally thought of everything. You are a God who is powerful and resourceful beyond all measure. My simple prayer is that you would teach us to commit all of ourselves to you, to trust you when we can't see, to believe when we feel blind. God, we commit all of ourselves to you now and we entrust the outcome to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you all for joining us today here at Bolenbrook Church, and thank you, Pastor David, for that inspiring word. Now, you might be wondering what's next for you here at Bolenbrook. If you're new here, if this is your first or second time, go ahead and fill out that connection card online. The links are in the description below under next steps. Now we wanna to get to know you better and see how we can plug you in here into this community. Now we want to invite you to a couple things. The first thing is to communion. Communion experience is happening today as part of our Connection Sabbath that happens every second Saturday of each month. Our Connection experience is a day where we get together and we study the word, we experience uh, communion together, we experience God together, and we share a meal together. It's all about connection. That's happening at the Living Water Church Activity Center, uh, and all the information is in the descriptions below. And we want to invite you because it's such a special experience to share communion with all of our believers. And we also want to invite you to our Easter series. Our Easter experience is happening next Saturday, April 16th, and there we are moving to two services. We're opening up our 10.30 a.m. service as well as keeping our 12.30 a.m. service. All of our children's programming is the same with our zero to four year olds happening at 11 a.m. and our five to 11 year olds happening at 12.30 p.m. So we wanna invite you to our Easter experience. Come and bring your friends, bring your family. We're gonna have a great time to celebrate the risen savior, Jesus. We also want to invite you to sign up to be a food pantry volunteer. Our next food pantry is happening this Tuesday from 3 to 5.30. And we want to invite you because it is a blessing to be part of a ministry that is serving our local community. And this ministry has been operating all throughout the pandemic. It's one of the only food uh, areas that was open uh, that had a stock of food that was able to give to our community members and our uh, people in this larger uh, Valley View community. So we want to invite you to be a part of this ministry. Uh, and help us out on Tuesday. We have plenty of spots to be filled. So go ahead and in the links in the description below, you'll see all of the information that you need. Now, if we have students 
in the ages of middle school or high school, fifth grade to seventh grade for middle school, eighth grade to 12th grade for high school, we want to invite you to sign up for Student Connections, also known as STUCO. The way you can do that is you can text STUCO to 94000. That's STUCO, S-T-U-C-O, to 94000. For all of our updates, for all the things that are happening, you can also email me, and my email will be in the link in the description below. And you can sign up to get your middle school or high schooler into community here at Bloomberg Church. We also want to invite you to be in community with us and connect with us during the week as we start every single week off with prayer. Monday morning at 7.30 a.m., we get together for our Bolingbrook Church push line. Push stands for pray until spectacular happens. And we want to invite you to experience prayer as a community every single Monday morning or join our Facebook page, Bolingbrook Church Push Line. We want to thank you so much for giving to this church and really pushing the vision and carrying the vision on your backs to create spaces for the people that God misses the most. We can't do this without you. All the ways to give will be on the screen here and we will accept any and all donations and let you know that every single donation you give goes to expanding the kingdom of God and a loving community here at Bolingbrook and around the world. Thank you so much for being who you are and being part of this movement that is happening here at Bolingbrook Church. We'll see you next week for our Easter experience. Take care and God bless.